Thank you, um, Dr. Kumta. Um, I've enjoyed this uh, conference immensely, um, although not from a legal point of view, but from a patient point of view, it's slightly unnerving and disconcerting. Um, and perhaps our next speaker can, uh, can sympathize uh, from all three perspectives, the, the, the medical, the legal, and of course the, the, the patient. Um, Dr. Bernard Murphy is a, is a partner at uh, the law firm of House Wombs and, and, and Bowers. Uh, he's also um, a is a medical doctor uh, with significant practicing experience uh, in the, the, the British military for the, for the army, as well as in uh, uh, public hospitals in the NHS system in the UK, private practice um, and public in, in, in Hong Kong, uh, before getting a law degree and switching to the, the legal sector. So I'm very pleased uh, to welcome Dr. Murphy um, and to listen to his presentation on request for deception. So please join me Thanks. in welcoming. Thank, thank you. Uh, th thank you all very much. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I, I work in a medical legal practice, and uh, I, I, yes, I, I trained as a, a doctor and worked as a doctor in private practice for some time uh, before uh, becoming a lawyer. Um, actually, my first um, medical practice, I was, uh, I was employed in the, in the army, in the British Army, which brought me out to Hong Kong in 1992. And, uh, and I've sort of more or less been here ever since. Um, one, I was, when I was practicing in the army, um, we were looking after patients who spoke English and patients who spoke Chinese and patients who spoke Nepali because we were looking after the Gurkha families who were based in the New Territories mostly. And um, of course, as a, junior, as a junior doctor, as I then was, um, we had to obtain, uh, you know, it was our duty to obtain consent from the patients before they, uh, before they were operated on or before procedures were undertaken. And I distinctly remember, even way back in 1992, 1993, feeling, un feeling uncomfortable, uncomfortable when um, I would go up to a patient uh, who didn't speak the language that I could speak, um, and I'd be handing them uh, an, a consent form in their own language, but a language which I couldn't read, um, and then asking them to sign it to confirm that they were happy to undergo uh, an operation. And uh, of course, within the medical profession, there was a lot of you know, uh, concern way back then as well about you know, are we, were we obtaining sufficient uh, and appropriate consent from patients. But it was, it was something which uh, stayed with me really from the very beginning of my, of my medical career. And uh, later on, when I, when I did start studying law, partly because of the interest that uh, I developed in law when I was practicing in the army, um, I re uh, recall being taken along uh, as a doctor uh, to um, watch a coroner's inquest with a, uh, with, with a friend who was giving evidence as a doctor at a coroner's inquest. And it was there at that inquest that I realized um, how important it was for, for the coroner to have um, the, the information about the deceased, the deceased's history um, and what had happened adequately exposed to the coroner, um, both by, by, by the doctors who had treated the, 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 uh, the, the patient, the deceased, and also by the family who may have witnessed certain things which they may have not been happy about. And it was really because of the experience that I had witnessing um, a number of coroner's inquests that I felt uh, drawn to, to, practice, to practice law uh, as a, uh, in a medical legal practice. Um, well, I've been asked to give some examples and to discuss uh, situations where perhaps doctors are asked to, uh, to, to maybe not give the whole truth, um, but maybe almost the truth. Um, and, uh, or situations where a doctor may feel, and this is quite often the case, the doctors might call me because I, I'm, I defend doctors. I represent doctors through their professional indemnity group. Uh, and they may call me and say, Bernard, um, I've got this situation. This has happened or this might happen. Am I allowed to do that? Am I allowed to say that? Could I get into trouble for this? Well, most of the uh, scenarios that, uh, th th that we come across um, for me, at least in my area of practice, uh, end up before the medical council. That's the regulatory body for the, for the doctors. Um, and when people aren't happy, when patients aren't happy, or families aren't happy, or other organizations aren't happy with the way a doctor, uh, what a doctor has done, uh, they might complain to the medical council, and the medical council will look into it. And we can see from the um, medical council's uh, code, code of conduct that they uh, describe um, uh, medicine as a profession distinguished from other professions by a special moral duty of care to save lives, to relieve suffering, 
Medical ethics emphasizes the priority of this moral ideal over and above considerations of personal interests. And if you look at the last paragraph, trust is essential to the practice of medicine. There can be no medicine in the absence of trust. At the bottom there, almost fell off the line. Um, so the, un the underpinning uh, concern that perhaps the medical council, the profession would have for doctors and the way they practice is the importance of the issue of trust. And with trust, that must mean surely uh, being open, honest, direct, clear, uh, truthful with the patients. Um, we see in the Code of Conduct, we'll just skip through this, I just wanted to draw your attention to uh, a number of points, but if we read through this duties of physicians in general, we can see that um, you know, from the top down, a physician shall always exercise his or her independent professional judgment and maintain the highest standards of professional conduct. So it's a requirement to, when acting, when advising, when treating patients, to be acting and doing so in an independent professional judgment, an independent judgment which hasn't been affected by outside forces, that this is the doctor's true belief and understanding of what's in the patient's best interest. Um, if we look at... Um, Further down here, a physician shall deal honestly with patients and colleagues and report to the appropriate authorities those physicians who practice unethically or incompetently or who engage in fraud or deception. Now, of course, deception is a, a, a word which covers a wide spectrum of uh, behavior or misbehavior, uh, and there's some of these um, examples which I'll be uh, touching upon during this, uh, during this lecture. The duties of physicians to patients. A physician shall act in the patient's best interest when providing medical care. <clears throat> a physician shall owe his or her patients complete loyalty and all the scientific resources available to him or her. Whenever an examination or treatment is beyond the physician's capacity, he or she should consult with or refer to another physician who has the necessary ability. We'll see, we see all from, from Shekhar's last case that um, there was, th that may well have been a case which was outside the first doctor's um, ca capability, and which, if the doctor had been honest with himself and with the patient, um, he would either have brought in someone else maybe to assist at an earlier stage or to advise the patient maybe to have gone to another uh, clinician before the actual treatment was, was offered. Well, once again, in the, in the Code of Professional Conduct, it's broken down into various sections, and if you have, ever have time to go on the Medical Council's website and to, to look at those various sections, you, you'll see that it's broken down into um, issues re relating to the professional responsibilities to patients. This includes consent, confidentiality, disclosure, um, communication, in, of communication uh, in professional practice, telling the patients the truth about what you do, what your level experience of expertise is, what your experience is, um, and there are other issues which I'll touch upon as I go through some examples on financial arrangements. Um, am I being honest with the patient, with the insurer, with the company, with regards to how much I'm charging, the, the doctor is charging the patient? Um, has the doctor been completely truthful in the disclosure that he's provided the insurance companies? Now, I think it's perhaps appropriate, in fact, one of the examples I'm going to give relates to um, uh, Winston, Churchill's, uh, Winston Churchill's physician, his private physician, uh, at the time that he was um, uh, the, the, the leader uh, of, the, uh, of the British Parliament. And of course, Winston Churchill was um, uh, the, the leader during the, during the Second World War. We've just, we've just celebrated uh, the end of the 70th, 70 years of the end of the Second World War. Um, <clears throat> His own personal physician was a, a man named Lord Moran. And Lord Moran, after Winston Churchill died, he died in 1965. And uh, after he died, um, his physician, Lord Moran, he uh, published a book called The Struggle for Survival. And The Struggle for Survival was all about Winston Churchill's health. Uh, and it disclosed an awful lot of material about Winston Churchill's medical uh, problems um, during the time that he had been uh, leader of the United Kingdom. And of course, Winston, and of course, Winston Churchill's family uh, was very upset about this, and they said, well, this is outrageous, this is a breach of you know, your duty of confidentiality, Lord Moran, to your patient. Um, but Lord Moran, maybe he was a bit under pressure from, from his own uh, publishers, um, and he was able to persuade 
um, the publishers and, 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 the, uh, and those that uh, were looking into this matter that actually, no, 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 he had obtained uh, consent from Churchill before Churchill died that he would publish information about Churchill's illness. And the information that he published, uh, some of the information in particular that the family was upset about, was information relating to Churchill's uh, mental health, uh, de battle with depression or the black dog, as Churchill called it, um, alcoholism. And um, the family said that this, you know, was peppered with, not only was it a breach of disclosure of duty of confidentiality, but also it was peppered with inaccuracies. Um, even even um, um, Churchill's own neurosurgeon, a, a, a doctor, Professor Brain, which I thought was a very appropriate name for a neuros neurosurgeon, even he said, uh, you know, look, I kept very detailed medical notes of Churchill when he was alive, and some of what um, Lord Moran is saying in, his, in his, uh, his book is inaccurate. So not only was he uh, breaching his duty of confidentiality in a large part by disclosing information which the family said he wasn't entitled to, but some of it was actually inaccurate. And... Um, and, and this, uh, of course, caused some, some great distress, although, like I say, Lord Moran still went ahead and published his book nevertheless. He was actually a, an eminent physician in his own right, Lord Moran. He'd been uh, dean of St. Uh, Mary's Hospital Medical School in London, and he was the president of the Royal College of Physicians for, for many years. Um, well, Churchill's um, own deception, it's not a medical deception, but uh, I thought I'd, I'd just sort of mention the fact that there is uh, Churchill's deception, was a great deception against the Nazi Germany in 1941 when uh, the Nazis were bombing, bombing England. Um, and uh, Ch Churchill had, had gone into secret negotiations with the, uh, with the, with the Nazis, um, trying to lead them, trying to deceive them, for them to believe that actually he was, or Britain was actually planning to sue for peace with Nazi Germany. Of course, they weren't. But um, Hitler fell for it, and he diverted his energies, at least for some time, to the Eastern Front, um, to the Soviet Russians, uh, to the Soviets. And as a result of uh, it, bought time for bought time for England, bought time for Britain to build their own forces uh, in preparation for moving into the the land, uh, the war on the land um, against uh, Germany later on. But uh, that was Churchill's own deception. Of course, he may have he may have uh, been um, a a. An expert, he may have had to have been an expert in, in deceiving uh, the Nazis at that time. But he's also, of course, perhaps better known for his direct speech and his his uh, openness and telling people what he thought. He had um, a, a, a sort of a difficult um, political relation, relationship with a lady called Lady Astor, um, who uh, once once upon a time it was it was uh, said that uh, they were walking out of the Westminster Parliament. And uh, Winston Churchill was allegedly inebriated after having a, a large lunch and a few uh, gin and tonics, or I think it was scotch that he drank. And uh, she said to him, um, she was very upset by his, his appearance, and she said to him, Mr. Churchill, I believe you are drunk. And she said, um, yes, madam, and you are ugly. <laughs> but in the morning, I shall be sober. Well... He, do, he wasn't deceiving anyone there. But of course, I don't, think our doc, I don't think any doctor would be sort of allowed to speak to a patient that way, especially not these days, um, not to be so, so direct. Um, but um, what, what situations are there then that we come across where doctors are, where there are requests for deception, uh, um, of, for doctors to deceive their, their patients? Well, <clears throat> um, or to deceive insurance companies, or to deceive anybody, in fact. Um, well, perhaps in my experiences as, as a solicitor, um, one of the uh, common areas that we come across where doctors call me and say, Bernard, you know, this has happened or I've been asked to do this, am I able to do this, is in relation to uh, sick leave certificates. I mean, sick leave certificates are very important because uh, they can be depended upon for, pur for purposes of employment issues, uh, for insurance issues, um, for a, a wide spectrum of other uh, legal issues. And so what a doctor writes in the uh, in the sick leave certificate is actually very, very important uh, and essential that um, the people relying on the set, that certificate know that the doctor is telling the truth. But um, there have been cases, and it, it does happen from time to time, where I come across um, cases where a doctor has been asked to um, extend the period of sick leave. So, for example, a patient might have seen the doctor on one particular day and the doctor has asked, you know, can you, uh, look, I know I'm, I'm here today and I'm not feeling terribly well, but actually I wasn't feeling too well yesterday either. And the doctor might initially say, well, 
I can't give you sick leave for that because I didn't see you and I don't know and, um, you know, and, and really it wouldn't be appropriate. But there are, you know, do doctors who might feel under pressure. Maybe this is a, a patient who he's seen for many years and maybe she's never asked him this question before or maybe for whatever reason he feels, well, maybe she was ill yesterday and maybe who am I to doubt what she's, whether what she's telling me is the, is the truth. And doctors can find themselves um, uh, caught out by, by that sort of situation. Or um, a patient who, who perhaps attended, um, attended a, a, let's say, a fracture, a fracture clinic. You know, she's got a, a healing fracture in her hand or her foot, and she goes to see a doctor, and um, she then asks for sick leave after the appointment. But she doesn't really need sick leave. She doesn't really need to be off sick that whole day. Maybe it's been inconvenient for her to come and see the doctor at 10 in the morning, but, you know, she could get a bus or a taxi back, and she'd go back to the office, and she could be working uh, with her feet up, but maybe there is really no clinical need for the patient to be off work, for somebody else to be paying for her to be at home. But quite often we come across cases where doctors feel very much under pressure to um, acquiesce to such requests, and they may feel that they, they, they ought to, or else they might lose the patient. Maybe they're worried, especially in private practice, where doctors are not just practicing medicine, but they're also running a, a business, um, they may feel under some sort of pressure that um, really they should try to keep um, the patient's happy, not just medically, but also socially, socially economically. Um, doctors also get into trouble when they feel they owe the patient something. Um, it reminds me of a case, uh, I've had several cases like this, where doctors, um, maybe to a GP, a non-specialist, seeing a patient, uh, treating a patient for a skin, um, uh, a skin matter, maybe not even a, a, an injury, maybe or not an illness. It may be cosmetic, and the doctor has decided, well, here's, uh, you know, we can we can do some cosmetic treatment here. We can uh, use this laser treatment, or we can use this heat treatment, or this uh, type of um, injection. And the doctor, not being a specialist, may not have explained to the patient beforehand that uh, he or she isn't a specialist. He may have just said, yes, I can do that. I can do skin problems. And when the patient walks into the doctor's clinic, maybe there are love, lots of nice pictures of patients with beautiful faces. Um, and patients feel that, oh, well, this doctor obviously knows what he or she is doing. I'll, I'll go for the treatment. And then there's a complication. And the patient comes back. And maybe the patient comes back having had a laser treatment. And the patient comes back two or three days later with, uh, with infection. Uh, you know, following a, a burn injury, following the laser. And the doctor thinks, oh my goodness, you know, this is, this is a problem. I, I really, you know, owe it to my patient to make sure that uh, she gets better. But also maybe there's something else on the doctor's mind. Maybe the doctor's also worried about the patient complaining. Maybe the patient has complained to the doctor, saying this is outrageous, you didn't tell me there was a possibility of me getting my face burnt or getting an infection. Is it going to scar? What's going to happen to, my, to me in the future? And the doctor might panic. And it's usually because of the panic that doctors then try to keep the case to themselves. They don't, they, the, the first thing they don't do is call a colleague who's a specialist and say, I've got this case, can I send her to see you because I'm really worried that there might be a complication that requires a specialist in dermatology or, or a plastic surgeon to look at her. But quite often we see doctors sitting on the case, holding on to it. Um, and unfortunately, with some cases, they don't get better, they get worse. Uh, and then the doctor is not only uh, going to have a complaint against him or her that she was out of her depth, that she hadn't explained to the patient um, that these complications could arise, but also that the patient might have felt misled, that the doctor was a doctor competent in performing such procedures, but not only in performing the procedures, but also in managing the complications of the procedures. Um, and uh, in, in that situation, you know, a, a complaint to the medical council would involve um, not only the fact that the doctor hadn't advised the patient appropriately, but that the doctor hadn't disclosed to the patient that he or she was not a, a particular a specialist in that area. Uh, and, and although perhaps the doctor's website and the, although perhaps the waiting room had these beautiful pictures suggesting otherwise, suggesting that this was their main area of practice. There's also, I mean, once again, on this sort of case, doctors often calling me saying, you know, Bernard, um, I've got this case where there's been a complication. And it may be, uh, let's say, it could be a skin problem or it could be an eye infection. Um, a doctor has treated a patient's eye and the eye's got worse. And it's looking nasty and maybe there's an ulcer on the eye. And maybe the doctor's thinking, I should refer this to an ophthalmologist. But maybe the doctor's boss, the doctor's managers in the practice, and this, once again, this is, you know, private practice. This doesn't happen, I don't think, in, you know, public hospital medicine, but 
um, the, the doctor's boss might be saying, well, you know, we can't refer all the complications to private, you know, to specialists. You know, if you, get a, if you see a patient who's got a problem with their eye, surely that's a GP problem. Surely a GP can manage that. And there are doctors, who, you know, I've spoken to who've, who've been worried that they felt under pressure from their bosses to hold on to patients, even though, even, even though the doctor might feel deep down, no, this is, this is going outside of my area of expertise. This may be something which I, I shouldn't be doing. I really ought to get another colleague to look at this case. But because of the pressure from his own boss, um, um, the doctor may hold on to the patient a bit longer, and once again, um, until it's too late, by which time you've got a patient who's very, very unhappy, who's got a, a more complicated problem, um, and who will almost inevitably complain to the medical council uh, about the doctors, um, uh, the way the doctors managed the case, but also the fact that the doctor hadn't referred sooner, hadn't owned up to not having the necessary expertise to, uh, to look after the case. I, I use this, I use this um, uh, six sickness certificate. It's not really uh, to demonstrate uh, anything in particular, except that, you know, so often doctors, there's lots of bits of paper in a doctor's surgery which doctors have to sign and send out, whether it's to the employees, the insurers, or otherwise. But one of the things that um, uh, doctors can be very careless of in private practice especially is what information they're able to put on their, uh, their notebooks, about their name and their details. And, um, and the reason why this is important is because the Medical Council is very strict about doctors not holding themselves out beyond their uh, own specialty. Um, so, for example, especially with general practitioners who are not specialists, putting down a whole range of um, you know, qualifications after their name that might confuse patients or might make patients think that they are specialists, specialists in, a, in a certain area. Um, I've had a case of a doctor who is a general, general practitioner, um, but she has a, uh, a, a psychiatric qualification in psychiatry. She's not a specialist in psychiatry. Um, and um, she was practicing or effectively as a psychiatrist. And she had a, a notebook which said at the top her qualifications. It didn't say she was a specialist in psychiatry. It didn't say, I am a specialist in psychiatry, but it had her qualifications uh, saying, uh, you know, uh, I think it was MRC uh, Psych, member of the World College of Psychology, uh, Psychiatrists. And then at the bottom of her, her signature there, um, this is not her s signature block, but at the bottom of the signature, it just said underneath psychiatrist. It didn't say specialist in psychiatry. It said psychiatrist. And of course, anyone, you know, any ordinary person reading that would think, well, she must be not only a psychiatrist, but isn't psychiatry a specialty? Therefore, isn't she a specialist psychiatrist? And um, this doctor, although she had uh, a, a, a qualification, a postgraduate qualification in psychiatry, she hadn't actually uh, practiced very long uh, as a, uh, in, in the field of psychiatry. She hadn't obtained her specialist qualifications, and yet patients were seeing her and getting um, uh, confused, thinking that she was actually a specialist in that area. And really, once again, this comes back to the fact that when I spoke to her about, about this case, which is some years ago now, um, she said, well, you know, I, th I thought that was something I could do. I thought that, um, you know, it didn't, or it didn't really matter. Um, I thought that it was something which um, everyone else was doing. And there were lots of excuses that she gave. But, um, but, but uh, I simply had to say to her, well, you know, you look at the code of conduct for doctors and look at what it says about specialists and the importance of making sure patients are aware um, of the specialty that you practice under and that you're on the specialist register. The specialist register um, uh, defines who in Hong Kong are specialists in whichever particular area of practice. <coughs> There's also situations where, and it's becoming, I think, increasingly more worrisome, when um, medical companies, and more and more of these medical companies are looking to uh, get listed in Hong Kong. And uh, so doctors at the moment, private practitioners, they may be single-handed or they may be in a small group practice. Um, and there may be some of these doctors that want to, who are doing particularly well, and they may think they want to list their companies on the stock exchange. And uh, one of the problems that uh, um, doctors are encountering is that in order to list on the stock exchange, they have to disclose certain information uh, to the stock exchange uh, and also to potential shareholders about 
who's working at the practice and whether there are any potential complaints and uh, complaints to the medical council or whether there's any claims and these sort of issues become very important but also what's important is for the uh, the doctor has a if you like a, a conflict issue because it may be that the doctor uh, himself now um, listing his company not only does he owe a duty to his patients a duty of care to his patients but also arguably the, the, he'll be torn between the patients and the duty to his shareholders because shareholders will be looking at what the doctor is doing and expecting that that company will make a, will make a profit for the shareholders. And doctors are therefore perhaps increasingly under pressure, as I've said before, to not only to hold on to, to their patients, but maybe to, to, do, to, to take more of a bite out of a case um, or to hold on to a case longer or to do more um, complicated procedures when perhaps they should otherwise consider referring elsewhere. Well, this is perhaps just a, a doctor. This is, I thought this was going to be a, a slide of a patient, but perhaps it's more really of a doctor who's <coughs> frustrated with, with, uh, with his situation and, and not sure whether, whether he should have explained to the patient that, uh, that um, disclosed to the patient that he wasn't really um, fit to do the procedure that he did for the patient. We have... Um, come across a case where, or at least one study, um, where doctors were asked about uh, deceiving insurers. Deceiving insurers because the doctors are trying to help their patients. The doctors are trying to help the patients recover the cost of a procedure, recover the cost of the insurance um, uh, from the insurer. And in this case, we have, um, in this slide here, we see that 74.5% of doctors, when asked, um, whether they would uh, adhere strictly to the requirement of the insurer um, in uh, providing care. So an insurer might say, well, you know, you can't treat this patient or we won't let this patient undergo this procedure unless they have meet this certain criteria, these symptoms. 74.5% um, of doctors said <coughs> um, they will practice as, I will practice as my patient's advocate working within the rules and restrictions of third party payers, so let's say the insurer, <coughs> as long as those rules do not significantly compromise my patient's interest. So in, in this case, we have doctors who are saying, well, yes, I'll, I'll adhere to what the insurance company requires until such time as I feel that uh, I need to um, blur the margins between what they have and what uh, I think um, uh, what they don't have in order for them to recover th um, the cost of treatment from the insurer. And uh, in the same paper, um, it, was, uh, it was shown that, for example, for coronary bypass surgery, where the insurer would only pay for, let's say, uh, for a uh, coronary um, arterial bypass graft, the insurer would only pay if the patient had progressive chest pain right, um, and increased frequency of pain. And when doc doctors said, well, if I, th if I think it's indicated that the patient should have that treatment, then even though they don't meet that criteria, I will nevertheless um, tell the insurer that yes, they do have uh, progressive chest pain and yes, they do have increased frequency of pain. And that was in 57.7%. So in 57.7% of cases, doctors said they would lie to the insurer um, for coronary bypass scratch surgery. Um, likewise, for um, artificial revascularization, for chronic arterial insufficiency. So where the blood flow to the, in this case, to the leg uh, was insufficient and a patient uh, would therefore need um, revascularization of the artery, um, the insurance companies might say, well, we won't, we won't cover the cost of that treatment if the patient has any pre-existing pre-gangrenous change in the skin. So in order to make sure that the doctors could carry out the procedure and in order to make sure that the patients could claim from the insurers, then 56% of doctors said they would lie to the insurer and say that the patient did not have any pre-existing pre-gangrenous conditions. Well, there are other situations where um, doctors are asked to, to perhaps not lie, but perhaps feel under pressure to, uh, to explain or give explanations about a condition or a, a treatment. Um, and in one case, for example, we have uh, insurance company doctors who perhaps feel that they have a certain um, 
that they may find that an insurance company that they're employed by or that they're contracted out to may, f may feel that they've got to reduce the number of claims that the insurance company is paying out. And, um, <clears throat> and this is just a cartoon from, a, uh, for, from an article which I was reading. Um, a, typical, a typical opinion from an insurance company doctor is the doctor simply saying, yes, well, you know, all the, all the injuries are pre-existing. They pre-exist the accident. I can see no reason why he can't return to work tomorrow. I and mean, of course, th that's something of an exaggeration, but we also see similar problems arising in any doctor who's at, at, asked to be an expert. Um, they're under a potential uh, uh, risk of perhaps being asked too much, either by their lawyer or by those in, uh, others instructing them to maybe um, advocate too strongly on behalf of the patient or on behalf of the doctor when giving their expert evidence. And of course, there's a duty of a code of conduct for, for experts to, uh, to ensure that they, when they're instructed as experts, to ensure that they uh, adhere to that code of conduct and act honestly uh, and objectively when they're giving their expert evidence. In one of the cases that um, we dealt with some years ago, uh, we had a query from a doctor who was working for a medical assistance company. And a medical assistance company is these companies which, you know, if you've got insurance and you're traveling, and they may, they may find that uh, they're asked to get a medical report from a doctor overseas so that they can decide what sort of uh, treatment that patient needs overseas or whether a medical evacuation is necessary. And these doctors that I spoke to, they say they come under an awful lot of pressure um, not only from patients who are overseas to get a report which will enable them to fly back, let's say, to Hong Kong for, for expert treatment, but also, um, on the other hand, from the insurance companies to say that, well, you get the medical report for us from, let's say, a remote part of China, but the insurance company will try the hardest not to have to, um, not to, have to uh, pay for treatment or pay for the patient to have to come to Hong Kong. So I'm going to, I'm going to close there because I've seen that I have overrun. Um, I just wanted to use these as illustrations of some of the situations where doctors are asked to perhaps um, not exaggerate, but perhaps not disclose completely what they truly believe, but perhaps they're um, going a bit too far in either advocating for a patient or um, acting too strongly on behalf of an insurance company or another person that has an interest in the outcome of the treatment. Thank you very much.